Okay, so here we are. And I think that's all right. I guess so. All right, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to read to you from the Gospel of Mark again. And I'm going to tell you that the Gospel of Mark is what you really should read first when you become a Christian. Now, the apostate church, they like to say, oh, read the Gospel of John. They have Gospel of John tracts, and I did the same thing. I, I promoted that too because I was in a church that did that. And they said, you know, here's you know, some Gospel of John tracts at the bookstore. Buy them, hand them out. You couldn't find Gospel of Mark tracts. It was just Gospel of John. And all of those Christian bookstores are absolutely apostate. Absolutely apostate. And we even considered it then. Even from in the apostate church, we considered it apostate. So that's saying something. That's pretty bad. I'm laughing because I'm not because I think it's funny, but because of the irony of it. So in case some of you want to criticize me, why are you laughing? Because it's apostate. No, and I've had some people doing that. It's terrible. You guys... You act like you lost your brain somewhere, you know? Just anything that you can criticize, you criticize. You need to behave yourselves, really, because you'll never be saved. And you aren't, because you're going around criticizing true ministers of the gospel and finding anything to argue with them about. Just stop it, okay? For those of you who are new in Christ, or those of you who are returning to Christ after being a prodigal child, right? You need to start with the Gospel of Mark. Sit down with it every morning for breakfast. I took this guy from the park who was homeless and took him to the donut shop every morning. We sat down and had milk and coffee and donuts. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Here he is homeless, and you know he's getting this free, free breakfast every morning. But he really wanted to hear about Jesus because someone else had mentioned Jesus too, and he didn't know who Jesus was. The guy tried to like, you know, do one of these apostate church type things where they got these pat answers of the seven spiritual laws or whatever. The guy didn't understand what... This homeless guy didn't understand it at all. He's like, what are you talking about? I don't know... I've never been to church. I don't know anything. I don't know anything about Christ or Christianity or anything. I don't even know what a church looks like inside. <laughs> you know, this is the way the guy was. He was a young guy. And um, I told him, I said, well, you know, and I had this with me. I was carrying this with me. The Lord told me to go to that park instead of another park that day. That I always go to this other park and I hadn't been to that one for a long time. And he said, no, 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 go down there. Right when I was at the crossroads, he says, no, no, go that way. It was a little farther, and it was hot outside, really hot. And, you know, it's a little hard on me. So I got up there, and uh, there the guy was. He was, he was lying on the bench, and, and he was just starting to move a little bit, and I sat down beside him. And he sat up, you know, and pulled his sleeping bag together, and, and uh, I had my Bible here, and we started talking. So I suggest we go to the coffee shop every morning, and, and uh, you know, I offered, I said, I'll take you to breakfast, and we can read the Gospel of Mark, and then you'll know who Jesus is. All right? It's, not, it's the shortest gospel, the shortest book there for the Gospels telling who Jesus is. I had to explain to him that the Gospels uh, are four books that are like biographies of Jesus. They're not complete biographies, but they focus on who he was, in his ministry on earth, and, and that the Gospels is not exactly what they are. They're, they're accounts of different people about Jesus' ministry and who he was, and they're called the Gospels. But the Gospel is the message about what, why Jesus came. So we sat down, pardon me, and um, I had him read out loud. And I would stop him. Like after every part, I'd stop him. And I'd, I'd say, now you, you understand what's going on here. I would summarize for him. Or I'd have him summarize for me. And I'd add to it, right? And the first time that Jesus encountered a demon, and what happened? The guy was in shock. I said, this is what Jesus did. Jesus went around throwing demons out of people. 
and healing those who are sick. He had never heard that before. He had never heard that before. And I imagine that, that some of you may not have realized that that's what he did in his ministry. It's one of the main things he did to prove that he was ushering in the kingdom of God. So let's read here. I'm going to start back in a little bit in the previous chapter here. Chapter 4. On that same day, this is where we left off before. My eyes are a little weak because it's in the evening and it's been kind of a hard day. On that same day, when evening had come, he said to them, this is chapter 4, verse 35. He said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already uh, filling with water. It was already filling with water. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. <laughs> and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So they saw it as if they were perishing. I actually don't think I need this. Try it out. Uh, then he rose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So now there, there are two kinds of fears here. The first kind is the fear of the elements of the physical world. Now that's not the same as the fear of the world, because the fear of the world is a whole collection of individuals. That's people. But this is fear of the physical elements. And he says, he's, he's saying that you don't have faith if you're afraid of the physical elements in this way. When Jesus is there with him, with them. But then because of what he did, instead of fearing the physical elements, they feared him. And they didn't, he didn't rebuke them for that. He said, but Ron, he, did, he may not have known. Of course he knew. He always knew what was in the hearts of the people. You see that. It says often about the Pharisees. He knew what was in their hearts. And then he spoke to that. In this case, he knew what was in their hearts. That they transferred that fear, instead of being afraid anymore about the elements, seeing what he could do, they were afraid of him. Because he was more powerful than the elements that they had been afraid of. So they no longer had to fear the elements, but now they had to fear him because he was more powerful than the wind. He was more powerful than the sea. Chapter 5. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of, I've got to wear this, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. How in the world can flesh tear apart chains? Even if it has superhuman strength, it's still flesh. 
how can it tear apart chains and break shackles? And yet it did. No one could tame him, he said. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones, wanting to be free of the demons. Trying to get rid of the demons, didn't know how, had no strength or power to do it, and he's cutting himself. Could be the demons trying to damage his body, just to torture him and torment him. It doesn't say. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. He ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. To the demon who worshipped Jesus, you say, Ron, I never noticed that. And it's sitting here right in plain sight. And the reason you didn't notice it is because every time that the apostate preachers preach on it, they don't want you to hear that because it doesn't fit with their theology. But it says right here, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him and he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Jesus replied to the spirit that was in the man who was worshiping Jesus but did not want to be tormented by Jesus and was afraid of Jesus. He was afraid of Jesus. He said, I implore you by God. <laughs> He's worshiping Jesus as God. Then he calls him son of the most high God. Notice most high God, meaning Jesus is another God to him. I implore you by God, the most high God, that you do not torment me. He was afraid of Jesus. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. That is a powerful passage when you take it and you take it apart and look at what's being said and what is really happening because of what is being said. This demon knows who Jesus is. He knows who he is. He gets down and worships him. And he calls him by name. How does he know Jesus' name? Even the demons believe and shiver, Jacob says. Remember that? Even the demons believe and shiver because they know who Jesus is. And they're terrified of him. This demon was terrified. He says, I implore you by God that you do not torment me, please. He, you know what he's calling on in Jesus? God's grace. He's calling on God's grace through Jesus, displayed in mercy. Grace and mercy are not the same thing. Grace is cheerfulness. Mercy is not giving them what they deserve in terms of punishment. I implore you by God, meaning the mercy of God, that you do not torment me. If God truly is merciful, please do not torment me. 
For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? Why would Jesus ask him his name? Why? Because Jesus knows every demon. And he wants to hear the name of this demon. And he answered, saying, My name is Legion. For we are many. Legion is like many. For we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. They didn't want to leave that country. They wanted to stay in that country. Now a large herd of swine, pigs, was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons, now all of the demons are begging him, not just one, through the man's voice. Now all of them, through their voices, start chiming in together. Can you imagine a legion of demons suddenly speaking from in and around this man, begging Jesus, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. First it's through the man's voice, but now it says the demons, all, it says all the demons. So all the demons begged him saying, they were all begging and saying together, send us to the swine that we may enter them. Send us to the swine that we may enter them. All, the whole legion of demons. Can you imagine how terrified anyone else must have been who was there? And at once, Jesus gave them permission. Jesus granted their request. Jesus had mercy on the demons. He showed the mercy of God on the demons. Have you ever heard that before in a sermon? It's right here. That's what's happening. That's what they begged Jesus for. And at once Jesus gave them permission. He gave the demons permission to do what they wanted to do. He didn't just let them do it. He, he verbally gave them permission to do what they had wanted to do. Then the unclean spirits went out of the man and entered in the swine. There were about 2,000, 2,000 pigs. That means that there were at least 2,000 demons inside this man because they entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Let's see, Ron, why would the demons drown the very swine that they begged to be sent into? Well, you'll see. It was to try to stir up trouble for Jesus. Jesus knew that. He's not stupid. So those who fed the swine fled. So there were other people there. They were feeding this, the pigs, and they fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened, the people in the city and the country. They went out to see what had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed with Jesus and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were afraid. They heard from the people who were feeding the pigs that Jesus had cast out the demons from this man who no one could tame, no one could bind, no chains, no shackles could bind him. And those demons entered the pigs and drove them into the sea and drowned them. And now that man who no one can tame, Jesus freed from over 2,000 demons. And you wouldn't be afraid. You would be terrified if you came and you saw that scene. Living there, if you came and saw that scene. And they were afraid. The disciples were afraid earlier. The demons were afraid of Jesus. 
And now the townspeople are afraid of Jesus. And those who saw it told him, told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Please, please go. Because they were so afraid of him. He was so powerful, they didn't know what he was going to do. He was so powerful. They already had that guy in the tombs and in the mountains who was screaming all the time, cutting himself, breaking any chains or shackles that were put on him. They couldn't tame him. He was possessed. And now here comes a man more powerful than this man. And they didn't know, they didn't want to deal with it. Just go, leave. Let us alone in peace. Kind of like the demons, right? So then, when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him. He permitted the demons with their request, but he didn't permit this man his request. There's a reason. Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Now, if you've read any of the Gospels, you'll know that Jesus sometimes told people, don't say a word. And one man, he did tell the Pharisees when the Pharisees pressed him. And when he ran across Jesus, Jesus chastised him and rebuked him. But this man, he, he told him to go and tell the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. He had compassion on the demons in the process of having com compassion on this man. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all were amazed, marveled. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. So then it goes on to the next story. That's the end of the pericope. So... That's, that's divided. Those two are divided apart from each other by a chapter division, and it shouldn't be. Because the commonality is those who feared Jesus, starting with the disciples. It's amazing. The disciples feared him because he was more powerful than the elements. The wind and the sea. They can destroy men and houses. The townspeople were, more, were afraid of him because he was more powerful than this demon-possessed man that was screaming in the mountains and cutting himself and couldn't be bound by chains or shackles and would break them. And Jesus was more powerful than that. He was more powerful than 2,000 demons possessing a man. And they were afraid of him. Even the 2,000 demons were terrified of Jesus tormenting him, pulling them out and tormenting them. That he had that power. That's the most amazing. How do we present Jesus? Do we present that Jesus? This is just chapter 4 and 5. This is the beginning of the 16 chapters in Mark. Do you ever hear anyone presenting that Jesus? No, no you don't. You always hear them presenting Jesus loves you, Jesus is sunshine and cotton candy, fluffy clouds, unicorns. Yeah. This is the real Jesus. This is Jesus. If you're not terrified of the power of Jesus, you don't know who Jesus is. And you should be terrified. May the Lord bless you as you seek him with all your heart.